video tonight in order to demonstrate uh, my progress on a new projector that I've been building. I decided to build this, uh, this additional projector because what I wanted to do is highlight uh, the, the capabilities of some of the new scanners that have come out. Uh, the EMS or iMagic 8000 series which I've installed in this projector and I'm building a duplicate of this in order to house the uh, Pangolin uh, Saturn series when they become available hopefully in the next couple of months. The design philosophy behind this projector is fairly similar to all of my other projectors, the ones that I've built over the past couple of years here. Uh, I've learned a little bit in the process and as a consequence I have made fewer mistakes when I've constructed this, but the overall philosophy is similar. I have the electronics and the power supplies on the first level. I have all the um, optics as well as the scanners on the second level, and I've divided them with a very thick milled flat aluminum plate that provides a rigid support for all the optics, as well as uh, taking advantage of the fact that because I'm using these vertical aluminum walls and compressing them with tie rods uh, using these posts, these 80-20 uh, brand posts to hold the walls in position. I create a very rigid structure to support the optical uh, table, almost like a, an optical bench, uh, so that I take advantage of the 4 millimeter uh, plate on the bottom, the 12 and a half millimeter plate here, and uh, I have a small plate that duplicates this that sits on top, just as it does on my other projectors, to keep dust and debris off of the uh, optical bench. Uh, in building this, one of the other things that I've uh, come to like with this type of design is the fact that each one of these components can be fabricated to meet the, the space that I need for the projector. It's not uh, prefabricated, it's built uh, by myself with easy, easy tooling so that I don't have to waste a lot of space. And again, as I've learned things, I've become more efficient in compressing the optics. And so this projector, which very conservatively puts out uh, 10 watts, uh, more than 11 within the projector head, is every bit as powerful as the larger projectors that I built about a year and a half ago. Uh, but it's just more compressed, more efficient use of space. And as a matter of fact, produces a substantially better optical output, again, because of some of the things that I've done differently. In building this, I also take advantage of the fact that because I can lift this plate off of the bottom uh, chamber and put it on some support posts, I've built long enough wiring between all of the different components that allows me to do that. I can actually uh, mount the lasers as well as the optical supports um, while the lasers are running. I actually work out the preliminary design for the arrangement of the different optics and then uh, as the optics have to be added in the optical train to bring the beams overall to the scanner, by uh, allowing the lasers to actually operate as I put in lenses, put in mirrors, uh, I can fine tune uh, variables that are very difficult to do, to do a design and to incorporate as you might do say on a CAD design because you have to take into account so many variables such as the thickness of an optical uh, element, uh, such as the arrangement of the screws and the hold downs not interfering with, uh, for example, the adjustment uh, screws. There's a lot of different features that make that a very nice uh, way to install the optics. And by uh, isolating the, uh, the optical components from each other uh, with, say, some cardboard or small wood uh, sheets, I can actually drill and tap uh, while the lasers are running. I use a low speed portable drill, ground everything. I do not use any lubricants and I clean off all the chaff with either my fingers or forceps or even sticky tape. And so I don't produce any high velocity components that would damage anything. I don't use a vacuum, I don't use compressed air. And so this has worked very well and allows me to place optical elements very close to each other, yet without causing any interference between the individual components. I like this. One of the uh, things that I usually do in most of my uh, projectors is I take advantage of the uh, high performance of long pass filters. I've used the Semrock filters in the past and the Edmund filters, the Edmund beam combiners, which perform very well. All uh, dichroics work better as long pass, but because these laser wave uh, components that I was able to obtain when I was uh, dealing and um, 
acting as a distributor for LaserWave, uh, gave me access to these very low cost and quite high performance dichroics that I'm now using here. This is a uh, short pass. It uh, adds in the red. And this is a long pass. The short pass operates almost as good, almost as well as the uh, Semrock MUX uh, series long pass filters and the Edmund um, beam combiners. Uh, the long pass uh, filter from LaserWave actually works better than any filter that I've seen. And with these each costing about an order of magnitude less than those other manufacturers' uh, dichroics, this just dictated I was going to change the order of the optics. Uh, I just of uh, the lasers, I just couldn't have uh, passed up such a savings. So instead of red, green, blue scanner, it's now green, red, blue scanner. Another thing that you might notice too is that the green uses telescoping optics. It's necessary because despite the three-quarter milliradian divergence of the laser wave laser, uh, I need to telescope that up to the full five millimeter entrance aperture of this uh, EMS 8000 scanner to bring the divergence down to on the order of about a third of a milliradian. It's necessary in order to make it match the divergences of these other two lasers. The output though is very clean and so therefore the laser wave does not require a spatial filter although it does require the telescopes. Both the blue and the red do benefit from spatial filtering and so rather than the typical feed your lasers into the main output beam line and out I take both the blue and the red and feed them away from the beam line and send them in sort of a uh, U-shape, bring them back, sideways, and out, back, sideways, and out. This gives me a lot more beam path and permits room for a spatial filter for each of these. You'll also notice that the blue spatial filter only uses two components because almost everything that is aberrant about the blue diodes when they're combined is in uh, one axis, and so I don't really need the additional um, cross uh, razor blades, but I do in the red, and so when I adjusted this, I've only used the two blades here and the four blades here. The, you'll see that both of these lenses are actually marked 75 millimeters, and the spacings here are about three millimeters different. I don't know if I can show that very effectively with this scale, but if I hold the scale with my fingers sort of against this as a stop to the back of this lens and then duplicate that movement here. You'll notice that the blue actually requires about three millimeters shorter in its uh, spacing compared to the red because of the fact that the dispersion in the glass means that this comes to a shorter focus. If you were to use an acromat though, that three millimeter difference could probably be uh, overcome and allow you to do all of the spatial light filtering in one uh, step. This might make it possible to make it more compact but a little bit more problematic to align. You'll notice that the red is cooled, uh, the blue is merely maintained at a, at a uh, room temperature, at plate temperature. Uh, the three-stage Peltier here runs this, um, these two diodes down to around minus 28 degrees centigrade and the output is then sent through the uh, beam combiner, beam expansion, and then finally the spatial filter. One of the things that I've decided to do with these lasers, and the reason that the beam performance is so great, is that rather than using multiple uh, di large numbers of diodes at low intensities, I've decided to drive these diodes very hard, and as a consequence, there's no knife edging in this projector. I'm just PBS cube uh, overlaying the two polarizations, which allows me to maximally expand both of these diode pairs to fill the five millimeter aperture um, input uh, for the scanner, uh, the 8000 series scanner. As a result, the divergence of the beam in the red is about a half a milliradian by about a quarter of a milliradian. The output uh, divergence of the blue is about a quarter of a milliradian and therefore the third of a milliradian that I get out of the green match fairly closely with the red because it's uh, somewhat asymmetric, giving me a slight halo on some of the horizontal lines as opposed to the vertical lines. Nevertheless, the performance is so good that uh, I've now reached what I think is the limit of what can be done with these flex mounts, these uh, flexure mounts with these uh, two millimeter uh, fine pitch screws. 
uh, you now are able to align the, uh, the beams are so tight that the alignment uh, with these uh, has enough drift because of the plastic nature of the metal that you have to come back several times at least uh, to fine tune the alignment so that you can get the beams to all uh, overlap to within maybe 100, 100 micro radians of uh, variation. There, to go past this, to go beyond this level of um, sharpness, you really are going to have to have a larger arm for these flexure uh, mounts or finer threaded screws uh, to allow even greater levels of precision. Um, the final result uh, when all the beams are combined, when sent through the scanner and sent down range to uh, the screen down there, I'm going to demonstrate the performance of the output of these beams not as a single spot on a wall, but actually as a full combined three color beam uh, 12 meters or 11.7 meters from the face of this projector to that screen over on the other side of the room and you'll see what kind of performance I was able to achieve by using that philosophy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and set up the test pattern. Uh, right now I'm running at 42K from this scanner and uh, you can take a look if you flip the camera around and you can see the beams that are being sent across the room I'm showing you in the light because I find that these cameras when I put it in a dark room are so overwhelmed by the uh, contrast that they tend to bloom out. So coming over here, as you can see me, but be careful not to expose the camera to the beams. This is an English rule, and each of these upper marks are one eighth of an inch, so therefore three millimeters, at a distance of essentially 12 meters, so a quarter of a milliradian of divergence for one of these marks. You can see that the result is, I don't know if it shows up here, but it's approximately two marks across here on the verticals. And you can even see there is a little bit of misalignment here, nevertheless. There's a little blue halo, a little bit of cyan on the left-hand side of the beam. In the horizontal, there's a little bit of red halo, where I would say that this is probably slightly more than a half a milliradian, or just about half a milliradian, or two marks. One of the things you'll also notice with the scanner, before I go back to finish up this video, is you'll see that where the lines overwrite, uh, the width becomes substantially greater, pushing upward toward almost one milliradian. And that's one of the problems that I think we're going to find, is that when projections become so good that we're down in the hundreds of microradian of divergence, uh, both the flex mounts as well as the scanners, especially their pointing uh, fidelity, are going to limit how much performance you can get. Even if I was to go to super polished optics and incredible, you know, automated, you know, adaptive optics for the projectors, and brought the line width down to maybe a quarter of a milliradian or you know a fifth of a milliradian, I think the overwhelming effect of the uh, beam misalignment, the rewriting uh, misalignment, will uh, deteriorate the performance of the projector and mean that that's the limiting factor. Hopefully, uh, the eye magic scanners with maybe better um, pointing or feedback, uh, position feedback, may do a better job of overwriting these lines. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the scanner itself because this is something also that has not been covered anywhere else very well. Now you can see here the eye magic scanners uh, have been set up for entry from the uh, right and out. Uh, apparently you can uh, disconnect and reconnect these two posts to allow you to have entry from either the right or the left by changing the orientation of the scanner motors as well as these two posts. I like uh, the fact that these posts uh, take advantage of the fact that we have an entry uh, with an X uh, canted about 14 or 15 degrees back. This allows us to maximize the usable aperture. I also like the fact that these hold down bolts here are completely out of the way of the scanner motors. They in no way interfere with the, uh, the scanners. I can bolt or unbolt this without any problems. Uh, another little neat feature is if you notice down here, I'm not sure you have enough resolution, uh, but the posts which obviously are disconnected from this uh, or are attached to this uh, base plate, this flange plate, 
have an indium film interface. It's not thermal grease. It doesn't depend on just clamping pressure. It takes advantage of the moldability of the indium to provide better um, coupling, better thermal coupling, but also better mechanical coupling. It's a nice touch. Um, the motors themselves, a nice stainless steel body in here, uh, they look substantially upgraded from the 4000 series I have in the big projector over there uh, to my left. And everything fit together very easily. Uh, they do have very good mirrors, as I demonstrated, even the throughput of these beams uh, dynamically through these with all the twisting and uh, vibration that may occur with these. Uh, still, I'm getting single pass, single right um, performance that's not substantially bigger than the underlying uh, spot size. Uh, I noticed that the plate that I have mounted, the amplifiers, are mounted on uh, the bottom plate here. And although the plate is uh, four millimeters thick and is aluminum, and there's thermal grease between the uh, flange plate that holds the drivers uh, to this, uh, when doing test patterns at 42K and full expansion on the screen, uh, these get uh, the bottom of the plate gets too hot to touch. I'm a little unhappy with that and I'm probably going to add a little more cooling. I just don't like transistors that are running hot enough to fry eggs and so that's one of the things I'm not super happy about. My only real gripe with this thing, these things is the tremendous height here. Um, Tom had offered to send me some documentation, uh, a CAD um, file that would allow me to make determinations as to how to set everything up here. I had made an assumption that everything was going to be more industry standard around 28 millimeters above the base plate. These are 38 millimeters above the base plate and nothing in his documentation provides any uh, specifications for the required optimal input height. Uh, I think that's really lacking in iMagic's uh, setup. Uh, you really are on your own and I'm glad that I did get these in hand before I made final adjustments to this. Uh, projector, but as you can see, I had to put a spacer here to elevate the blue diode. I had to make some tips uh, to bring up the beam here and then level out the beam for the red diode. And actually, this telescopic mirror is not the same height as this telescopic mirror because as you can see, I'm stepping up as we're going over here to take into account an upward beam. Uh, I think that's my biggest gripe with these, but despite that, I'm very happy with these uh, scanners. I would definitely purchase them again, and the only reason I'm probably not going to buy another pair immediately is I want to see what the Saturn series is going to do. So uh, that's my short review of this. Uh, I'll finish up the video with uh, maybe a little bit of some uh, imagery uh, that I was able to produce with this scanner, and you can just take a look at some of the uh, performance by taking a look at that. All right, here is a darkened room, and I'm going to project some uh silent laser, and you can take a look at the projection 42K. This is about a 30 degree projection angle, and this is one projector. You'll notice the fineness of some of the single written lines. You'll also notice the uh, blending of colors, just the 42K uh, speed seems to produce very smooth, almost creamy color transitions in some of the color rings that will come up in just a few seconds. It may, be not sh it may not show up well on the camera, but the lines are so small, so thin, uh, they look almost as if they've been drawn there uh, from a much closer distance. An interesting thing to keep in mind is that the human eye in 2020 vision at the distance of this projector really can only resolve about a third of a milliradian. Uh, anything finer than that just gets bloomed out on the retina. And so anyone standing at the projector really couldn't see lines much finer than the lines that are shown with this projector. Now, certainly an audience that's twice as close or three times as close would benefit from much higher uh, sharpness images. And that is one of the drivers for continuing to improve it beyond this point. But I'm extremely impressed uh, with this scanner. It's not streaming. The uh, motors themselves in their uh, 
support barely become detectively warm, even scanning this uh, complex image. And uh, other than the amplifier boards becoming hot, I think this uh, seems like a pretty well put together package. Notice the lack of tails on any of these uh, point, these white points. And notice the color rings. Uh, there's really no disjoint. Uh, you can see a small point where the light must be uh, entering the ring. But look at the color transitions. They're very smooth. Also, the spinning of the grid, uh, there's no tails. And despite the fact that I'm not using a diode direct green, I'm using an old-fashioned BPSS, with the uh, incorporation of the color correction board, uh, I don't really see any uh, tails, red, green, or blue. So I'm very pleased. I hope this was a uh, reasonable review of the scanner as well as my projector. And hopefully if we get together sometime in the spring, I can demonstrate this uh, in person to anybody who's willing to come to Boston. So thanks very much for watching. I appreciate it.